Good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen Ramel, and I'm the Interim Director of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. I am delighted to welcome you all to our reimagined Open House 2020. We are calling it Open House at Home. So each year, we are so excited to open our campus to the surrounding community and share our extraordinary research and our love for the planet with our community. This year, we are, oh God, I'm sorry about the dog barking. This year, we are especially excited to host our local and virtual neighbors. Much has changed about how we interact these days. We've shifted our in-person events and programming to an online format. We've put together digital panels, education models, lectures, and demonstrations, all of which have allowed us to continue to meet with you where you live, while also expanding our reach across the United States and the world indeed. We are engaging far more people than we ever could have in person. And for that, we are really excited and we thank you for tuning in. Lamont's Open House is in many ways a celebration of our science and our extraordinary planet. And every, as we do every year, we hope this event raises the awareness of visitors about the workings of our dynamic planet and the changes we face in a warming climate. We especially hope to ignite a deep and abiding love for and interest in the earth and climate sciences. And for school-age children and young adults, plant the idea that a career in earth and environmental sciences is an exciting and rewarding adventure. And I think you'll see some of that here today in our panel here. Our many lectures offer an opportunity to hear directly from our scientists about their most current explorations and discoveries. This year's list includes a vast range of subjects from cutting edge science of carbon capture to the work of understanding our changing coastlines and the risk of sea level rise to our efforts to proactively cultivate a more diverse and inclusive scientific community. This evening, you will hear from four of our scientists, Kirsty Tinto, Jonathan Kingsley, Jim Davis, and Jörg Schaefer, on the many aspects of Lamont's research surrounding changing ice and changing coastlines. This initiative works to understand how fast sea level is rising and how fast it will rise in the future by quantifying past ice and climate behavior, as well as the present state of the planet's ice. What are our ice sheets doing right now? Using all this info, we want to be able to better predict how, why, and where sea level will change around the world in the decades to come. So I'll start by introducing our scientists, I'll start with Jörg Schaefer. Jörg is a climate geochemist that leads a Lamont research group that specializes in extracting and analyze, analyzing cosmogenic nucleides from rocks, sediment, water, and ice. Jörg, welcome to the panel. Can you introduce yourself and say a few words? Yeah, I can. Thank you, Mo. Thanks for the introduction. And um, welcome, everybody, from my side as well. Thanks for being here and spending the next hour with us on the fate and the future of the polar ice sheets. It's, it's really important. So as Mo said, um, I'm a climate geochemist. So as a job description, we have the privilege to go to some of the most beautiful places, take samples, bring them back to the lab, and then measure them in complicated geochemical laboratories and learn more about the planet and um, the climate system in general and the ice sheets um, in, on, around, the, around the globe. My group in general really is interested in everything that has to do with changing ice in response to climate change. It has mountain, includes mountain glaciers and the ice sheets. And very recently, we are focusing on the Greenland ice sheet. Um, mainly because we are so worried about it. The fate of the Greenland ice sheet and the changes in the Greenland ice sheet are most of, well, among the biggest worries we have as geoscientists and as a community, as society as a whole, actually. Well, and this lab that Mo described as the Cosmo lab, which sounds um, a little bit um, freaky, it, it um, is really a powerful method because we recently figured out that the bedrock underneath the ice sheets holds information um, about when the ice sheets were gone, when they were, when we had warm periods and the ice was gone. And we are in the moment um, freakishly working on reading out this new archive with these new methods. And 
The bad news is the early tales that we learn from this are not good. Um, the Greenland ice sheet seems much more unstable than we thought and hoped. The good news is we have these new diagnostic tools and you can think about that like in medicine, we know the Greenland ice sheet is sick. Um, and it's much better to know exactly where the sickness is at work and um, to understand really what's going on. And there we are now much better equipped in the next, so that, that's our mission to really understand the patient Greenland ice sheet better and to much, much better predict how much the Greenland ice sheet will lose ice and will contribute to sea level rise in the next 50 years and the next 100 years. Well, we'll circle back and, and, and ask you some more about that shortly. The next scientist I want to introduce is Kirsty Tinto. Kirsty is an associate research scientist in the Lamont Fuller Geophysics Group. Kirsty led all three field expeditions of the Rosetta Ice Mission to survey the Ross Ice Shelf, and we'll hear more about that later. This is in West Antarctica. Kirsty also works on local responses to sea level change around Greenland. Kirsty, welcome. Hello, thank you. Yes, I'm Kirsty Tinto. I've been at Le Mans for 10 years now, and in that time I've been involved in some really large scale observation campaigns in both Greenland and Antarctica. Um, a lot of my work has been done from aircraft because these ice sheets are really big, and if we want to understand them, we need to measure them. And a way to make precise measurements over large areas is to put a lot of instruments on a plane. And fly back and forth so that we can actually map the planet that we're living on and start to understand how it works. So I've spent a lot of time in planes over extraordinary landscapes measuring the surface and looking inside the ice and my personal um, obsession <laughs> is the landscape underneath the ice and how different systems, uh, the, the way that the ocean moves and the way that the ice moves over the landscape and how they interact with each other. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that work and I'll, I'll get to talk to you about some of it l later on. And um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Kiersey. We'll, we'll definitely be circling back, back to that. Um, the next scientist I'd like to introduce is Jonathan Kingslake. Johnny is a glaciologist and an assistant professor at Le Mans and is, in, in, and is also in the polar geophysics group. His work is focused on modeling and observing ice, as well as the water that is flowing in, under, and over ice sheets and glaciers. Johnny, welcome. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, I'm Johnny Kingslake, as you said, and I've been here for about four and a half years. And we're going to hear a lot about how ice sheets and glaciers change, and specifically how they grow and shrink. And I think what my, me and my research group really focus on is the processes which allow the ice sheets to change, you know, how they grow and how they shrink. And so we'll talk about some research projects which I'm leading and involved with, which are all about how the ice sheet could, or particularly Antarctica, could, could shrink quite dramatically in the future. So look forward to that. Thank you. Yes. Um, and, and then the, our final scientist tonight is Jim Davis. And Jim is a geodesist and Lamont's Associate Director of Seismology, Geology, and Tectonophysics. Jim uses space-based and satellite techniques in his work to infer ice mass changes and to model and measure sea level change. Jim, welcome. Tell us a few words about yourself. Thank you and hello everyone. I also came to Lamont about 10 years ago. I didn't know that you also did. Kirsty, I just assume anyone I see has been around longer than I have. Before that, I was at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics for 20 years. My specialty, as Mo said, was is geodesy. It's not a very commonly um, uh, known science, but it is the measurement and interpretation of changes in the Earth's shape, its gravity field, and it, in its rotation. And as most said, I use satellite and astronomical techniques to measure these changes. Specifically now, I'm focused on quantifying present day sea level change using a broad array of these space-based as well as land-based observations. There's, there's so much noise in this system that obtaining really accurate measurements of sea level rise are actually quite difficult. Um, I, I often say, uh, you know, imagine standing on a seashore and you have the waves lapping up on your feet. 
and it's the water subsides and goes away and it comes up and maybe the tides come and go. And now imagine going away and coming back after a year and saying, well, this ocean has risen three millimeters. <laughs> that's not easy to get. And uh, that's primarily what I'm uh, involved with. Thanks, Jim. Well, so I hope you've taken away by now that the big overarching problem here is how stable are the polar ice sheets in a warming world? And my favorite expression, what happens at the poles doesn't stay at the poles. As the polar ice sheets melt, that water goes into the ocean and that water shows up on beaches all around the world. So I'd just like to start by asking collectively the group, why is the sea level rise? And as Jim says, just three millimeters a year. Why is that such a matter of global concern? What are the stakes? That's a big question. Who wants to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can say something about that. The, you know, despite these small values of sea level rise, um, they can have serious impacts on coastal communities. And we as a civilization have ended up living near the coast. You know, predominantly, we've done a lot of our development and you know, culture has been developed near the coast. We've got 700 million people around the world in low-lying areas. And the other really interesting thing is that it's not just about a certain area of beach being covered with water, which wasn't covered by water previously because of sea level rise. It's, due, it's all about changes in how often big floods happen. And it's what a really interesting effect is that you raise the sea level a little bit, damaging floods actually get drastically more common. And so that's one thing to bear in mind when you're hearing these small numbers sound a little bit small, it's actually have these outsized effects on people trying to make, have, have their lives and their livelihoods in coastal areas. Those little numbers have added up too over the course of the industrial revolution. We've had about a foot of sea level rise here, here in New York City, and, and, and certainly the damaging king tides and storm surges are, are already felt. Um, Kirsty, tell us a little bit about the Rosetta Ice Project. What was the goal of this multi-year program in West Antarctica, and why is the Ross Ice Shelf so important to thinking about future sea level rise? Uh, the Rosetta project was one of the examples of those big airborne projects that I was talking about when I introduced myself. And um, it was a, a multi-year, multi-institution, interdisciplinary program to take the largest ice shelf in Antarctica and try and understand it from top to toe. Um, the Ross Ice Shelf is about the size of either France or Texas, depending on what your references are. Um, but it, it's really big and it's presently, um, it appears to be quite stable. But we know from the geological record that it has collapsed in the past. So we know that it it can change. And, um, and it's an important one to understand ice shelf, shelf processes in general. And it's a very powerful one because it's holding back about 20% of the whole Antarctic ice sheet is slowed in its flow by the presence of the Ross Ice Shelf. And um, an ice shelf is where the, the, the large ice sheet that's been resting on the rock has flowed out towards the coast and then has gone afloat. And so you've got hundreds of meters of thick ice floating like an apron on top of the sea. And that makes really important parts of Antarctica incredibly difficult to understand because uh, we really want to understand the interactions between the ocean and the ice, because the ocean brings heat in to, to melt the ice and allow the grounded ice to contribute to sea level. And if you don't know what the sea floor looks like, for example, that's, that steers that ocean water through to where it contacts the ice, then it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future as, as the oceans change and how the ice will respond to that. So we so know the ocean is warming and, and you're trying to figure out how what's happening under this ice shelf yeah so you know what happens next um, oh. uh, and and this program was uh we we used an instrument suite that was developed here at lamont called the ice pod and uh, it was able to measure the ice shelf from its surface its ice thickness the internal structure of it and right down into the seafloor and um this used to be the most poorly mapped part of the ocean floor on the planet we had one point every 55 kilometers I, 
apologize for being scientific and European. So everything's in kilometers for me, but someone can <laughs> back that out. <laughs> and uh, and we we were able to to build a new map line by line um, using the airplanes flown by the New York Air National Guard and um, understand more about why that part of the system is vulnerable and what changes it would take to, to make that shift and, and kind of to fire up the modelers and say, hey, we've got some new processes that you need to incorporate into your, into your computers. Can bring us some better answers, please. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. And, and, and while you were exploring with, with airborne instruments, Johnny, I know that you've spent quite a bit of time literally on the ice with snowmobiles camping and, and, and exploring extremely remote places where no humans have really ever gone before. Can you tell us a little bit about that work or maybe also yeah. tell us about the Thwaites Glacier Project, which is another large area of Antarctica that could potentially be unstable? Absolutely, yeah. So I've done those kind of field work in Greenland and in Antarctica. And, you know, there are some, some things you can measure from planes really effectively. And it makes a lot of sense to be flying a plane around because you cover a lot of area. But, uh, you know, luckily for people who enjoy going to ice sheets and standing on them, there are still some things which you really can't do from a plane. So you have to go there and stand and use your instruments directly on the ice. And so I spent several months, so you know six or six or so months now sleeping in a tent and driving around in a snow machine which is like a motorbike but with a big track on the back which pushes you around um taking measurements with radar so it's like pinging radio waves like you like you see at an airport you know pinging out radio waves looking for where planes are it's actually going down into the ice and measuring how thick the ice is and measuring how it's flo how it's flowing so mo mentioned this thwaites glacier and this is one of these one of these glaciers which are all part of the antarctic ice sheet this big slab of ice at the south pole and we really care about the thwaites glacier particularly because it's really wide and it's really thick and the the rock beneath it slopes inwards as you go towards the south pole and it's in an area where the ocean is very warm and it's melting away at this side of the ice a lot so it's re it's retreating and shrinking now very quickly and it, the predictions are that it's going to continue doing that. So why are we going there? Well, we're going there to use that radar I talked about to measure how the ice is flowing now in detail to try and improve how computer simulations describe the ice flowing over the rock underneath. But it turns out, un unfortunately, it turns out that that's a really hard thing to describe and it really ends up being very important for the future of the ice sheet in the, in the computer models. So quite long winded way of saying we're going there to measure this process to try and describe that better in computer models so that we can predict sea level rise better and um, help coastal communities deal with changes in the future because they need to know what's going to happen in order to plan better. That, I mean, that's so important. I mean, we, we know just from physical observations from tide gauges that the rate of sea level rise is, has almost tripled over the last hundred years, really kind of almost going in lockstep with the increases in CO2 and global warming. Um, and, 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 you know, we need to know how it's going to change in the future. It, it impacts everything, building, infrastructure, planning, people's livelihoods, economies. So it's so important. Um, another incredibly fascinating way we can study the history and behavior of the polar ice sheets is with satellites. And I'd like to ask Jim for a minute if he could just speak a little what bit to how his work intersects with this study of changing ice and its impact on sea level. And, and Jim, I'd really like to ask you what most concerns you about what you find in your research about the global polar ice sheet budget? Um, well, there are several things actually. Um, so l l let me back up a little to, to say how we do use satellites or how I, at least I use satellites and other, uh, me uh methods, uh, space-based methods. Um, I was on the GRACE science team and GRACE is a satellite, NASA satellite mission, flies at around 500 kilometers and there's two satellites. At that height, 
you can actually see the uh, changes in mass of the ice sheets in response to the melting. So uh, what, you, what it senses is, of course, gravity change. And you can see the satellite speed up or move down. At that height, you don't see people walking around or you don't see small mass changes. You just see these massive mass changes that are associated mostly with large complexes of water moving around on the Earth. So wait, to, 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 so just to say, explain this. So a satellite would be going, heading towards the pole. It would see this big mass of ice ahead of it. It would pull the satellite toward it a little faster with That's its gravitational exactly. attraction. And since the other one is following it, it sort of sees that the one in front of it is speeding up for some reason. That's that so gets, amazing. Yeah, that gets, uh, well, it wasn't my idea, but it is, it is a great idea. <laughs> And, um, and, and they can, and the satellites going year after year after year can sense ch decreases or increases in the mass of the ice sheets in every place. It, 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 uh, we get a complete gravity field for the Earth about once a month. And uh, originally it was a five year mission. And uh, I don't know how many of you know the way that NASA does things, but they're in these discrete missions, start and an end. And as we went along, we realized that this is really isn't a five-year experiment. This is something that we need on a continual basis. And so now the second one is up there, um, the, it's called the GRACE follow-on mission. And hopefully from now on, we'll have continuous measurements uh, of the global gravity field, because that really gives us a handle on where the water's going. You can see the water leaving the land also in response to droughts and things like that. So it's not just sea level that the um, experiment is useful for. Uh, but you asked me about what was, uh, what are uh, my, some of my biggest concerns about the global sea level budget? Well, one thing is that even though, as we said up till now, it's only been a few millimeters per year of global sea level change, um, I'm a little worried that at that magnitude, that, that's not enough to really spark a, a, an emergency reaction from humanity, right? Um, you know, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, three millimeters a year is no big, big deal. And even over a century, uh, you know, a foot, whatever, it's, it can be dealt with. The thing is over the next century, that's not expected to maintain itself. It's supposed to increase very rapidly to the point where we're talking about half a meter to a meter of uh, sea level change uh, in the next uh, 80 years or so. So that's one thing that worries me, that the, the, the sea level change actually hasn't been rapid enough, that we've noticed it, that it's, that, that it's on people's minds, and mitigation of this problem will take a long time. It's not something that we can just go out and the next year engineer a solution to. It's a very t difficult problem to mitigate. Um, and, um, you know, it's even, it, it's even uh, because in different places on the globe, the sea level rise is different. There are places like in New York, for instance, um, where sea level rise has, a, has been um, decreased in a sense because we're within, we're so close to Greenland that as Greenland loses mass, so uh, the, the, these ice sheets are heavy enough that they actually push the earth down. As they lose mass, the earth comes back up. If you're close to Greenland, like we're fairly close to Greenland here on the Northeast coast, the earth is actually rising in response to sea level change at the same time that you're dumping water in the ocean. So we haven't quite seen the full effect of what we might get when Antarctica starts to kick in. Mm -hmm. And Antarctica is supposed to, you know, you've heard that these, it's not a nice slow process. It could happen um, uh, very rapidly in some places um, as massive amounts of ice are lost very quickly. So one of, one of the advantages I, I always see about geologists and earth scientists is, is that we think of processes unfolding over very long time periods. So when somebody says sea, sea level could rise by two feet by the end of the century, we think, oh my God, that's practically instantaneous. We need to start 
dealing with that now. That's just around the corner. Um, the other thing that as our scientists we know is we have looked to the past and, and, and we'll turn to Jurg in a second here as he's, he's an expert on the past history of the Greenland ice sheet, but we've been able to reconstruct how fast sea level has risen at times in the deep past. And we know that when ice sheets are really out of equilibrium, sea level can rise at rates of meters per century. So the possibility is there for, for a very profound kind of acceleration, even from what we're observing now, if the ice sheets become very unstable, um, which m seems like it would be an excellent segue to you, Jörg, to tell us about uh, your recent work in Greenland and what you find and how this makes you think about the potential for future change of the Greenland ice sheet. Yeah, I mean, that is pretty much along the lines. I just have a longer, um, as you said, a longer time scale a little bit in mind. This by no means does make things better. So I want to quickly talk about two things. One is um, um, a recent summary paper that really sums up a 10 research group five year effort in Greenland um, that was led by Jason Bryan at University at Buffalo called Snow on Ice, and it's summarized in a nature paper. And what, what we did there is, we, we got together a new set of paleoclimate reconstructions that were better for over the last 12,000 years that were an improvement. And we used those new data and drove a state-of-the-art high-resolution Greenland ice sheet model with that and looked how the margins were fluctuating over the last 12,000 years and how the configuration of the Greenland ice sheet changed over the last 12,000 years. And we could calibrate that on the ground with our cosmogenic nuclei technique. So we went there and took samples directly at the margin and underneath the ice and in front of the ice and reconstructed what we saw in our cosmogenic signature, what really happened over the margin. So we could, for the first time, calibrate in a way um, this, this Greenland ice sheet model over a long period of 12,000 years without, that was obviously happened, everything happened naturally. So we didn't, humans weren't the player. And then we used this calibrated um, green and ice sheet model and predicted what would happen in the next 100 years until the end of the century, so in 2100, um, based on that, that model configuration. And unfortunately, the result was um, basically a hockey stick. So there were changes over the last 12,000 years and there was um, a period where it was warmer called the Holocene Thermal Maximum and the Greenland ice sheet responded quite significantly but all of that is completely dwarfed to what will happen in the next hundred years or what's happening now. So we are an extreme acceleration curve of the Greenland ice sheet melt and we drove that for the future with everything, all the scenarios that the IPCC reports provide us, the most optimistic ones with the smallest warming, already exceeded substantially everything that we have seen over the last 12,000 years. And unfortunately, the more realistic one is now the more aggressive, the um, RPC 8.5 is, is kind of gave us rates of change that are more than four times about the, the highest change that we have seen over the last 12,000 years. So it's really a hockey stick situation. And coming back to what Johnny said, a few millimeters per year seems small, but I mean, look what's happening already at our coasts with that rate that we have. And we are on a curve that is rapidly accelerating. Sea level goes up exponentially. We don't know exactly the exponent, but what we found out, unfortunately, I really would wish in a way we had a better message, but um, with all the new, new perspectives we have, the Greenland ice sheet throughout most of my career was not one of the major worries in terms of direct sea level um, contribution because it was kind of assumed and we had thought we have evidence that it's relatively stable. It's also very hard to melt in a way because it's a huge ice cube on bedrock. But unfortunately, we know now that and um, that was not the case. So it is so here, the 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 hockey stick. With you know, when the I, the history of the Greenland's going along, where is that inflection where you uh, see that melting really accelerating? Is that well, it really started? In, it started about we started the, the onset of the hockey stick is really twenty years ago, and it goes now um, acceleratingly exponential until twenty one hundred, mm -hmm. and again. 
we can have that there is a little bit variation between the different climate predictions that we have, but it's in all of the cases it's dramatic. So the, the other news, which is a little bit better, if you so want, uh, particularly scientifically, it's better. So what we've figured out recently is that there's obviously bedrock underneath the Greenland ice sheet. So there are two miles of ice and underneath there is bedrock. And it's kind of crazy, but the bedrock underneath these two miles of ice contains the cosmogenic signature of the last time the Greenland ice sheet was gone. So we figured out that with the bedrock underneath the ice sheet, we have an archive of the smaller, the Greenland response to warm periods. So we can basically drill through the ice sheet, get these bedrock samples and map out how the Greenland ice sheet responded to past warm periods. And that um, it is really a scientific dream that we can have these direct observation, a scientific dream coming through. Having said that, we are very early on in reading out this new archive and this new direct information, but we already can say that the Greenland ice sheet was gone several times during recent geological times, which is very concerning and very unexpected in, in, in a way. And I think we can even now say that it was gone during the last big interglacial that um, is kind of 400,000 years ago, the marine isotope stage 11. Greenland was completely gone more or less. Um, but then coming back to this millimeter per year rate, the more important question really in a way, I mean, geologists and we are always interested in when was Greenland gone? But the question is, when does Greenland melt in a way that it delivers the first, net the next foot of sea level rise? And how did that happen? Where does it melt? At what rate does it melt, etc.? That's way more important for the, for the societies in the moment. So the next foot is key. And there we have the tools. We can map this out. We can investigate that and we will produce a map that will tell us, I, I think, and I'm very optimistic that, that we, we can point to the most vulnerable margins and say that that is where it will happen again. And that's well, actually, this, yeah. This is also why it's so important that we have so many of our scientists and our instruments out observing all the different places around the Antarctic, polar ice sheet and the Greenland polar ice sheet. And yeah. in thinking about sea level, um, Jim, you alluded to something that's really interesting and, and, and another kind of expression I often use with, with non-scientists is that it, it would be wrong to think of the ocean as a bathtub where the sea level goes up and down equally everywhere. And actually the, the surface of the ocean is, is much more complex and it, and it has, think, has to do with things like the gravitational effects that Jim referred to. And one of the really ironic things that, that was such an epiphany to me when it was explained to me about 10 years ago was that the Greenland ice sheet is so massive, it pulls the ocean towards it just with its gravitational attraction. And ironically, that means as the Greenland ice sheet gets smaller, the ocean uh, falls away from the coast of Greenland. And so I'd just like to ask Kirsty and Jonathan a question right now. Ironically, the coastal communities of Greenland are gonna experience a drop or a fall in sea level as the Greenland ice sheet melts. And I know that both of you are working with a project called Greenland Rising, rising out of the sea, um, with local communities. Can you talk about what that experience has been like for you working with, with, with the indigenous communities in the region? Well, yeah, th this project, I think, is a great one to to bring together everything that we've been talking about already this evening, because uh, the project that we're working with is a uh, is looking at four different communities around Greenland and how they how they will experience sea level change in the next hundred years or so. And um, it's it's bringing all this cleverness all these satellite measurements and uh, geological history models of the ice sheet and uh, processes and understanding of how the ice, is, the ice and the ocean and the earth are gonna change in the future. And uh, that's all quantitative. And people have been living in Greenland for a very long time. And they're all living on the coast because there's an ice sheet in the middle of the country. And um, so Greenland is just a series of coastal communities with people who know how to live there and know how to live through change. 
but we're expecting changes that haven't been lived through before by people. And so we're trying to bring together um, the understanding of the people who really know a place and the understanding of the people who know a planet <laughs> and, uh, and trying to get all these quantitative models to and, and make measurements within these settled, these towns um, to, to try and bring our predictions and the understanding of how to live in a place to develop models of how individual communities can be resilient and can anticipate the changes that are coming and can prepare for them. So that's, a, that's the, the heart of that project and why it's so relevant to what we're talking about this evening. I, I love that expression, the people who know a planet brought together with the people who know a place. Johnny, have you have you worked in these communities as well? Well, no, I mean that's a beautiful way of putting it, Kirsty. So I can't really top that. But the um, so that so the the project is a really great one because it is bringing in those communities and and much to Kirsty's credit, really, that hasn't been completely curtailed by COVID. This project it has gone ahead, even though there was plans for many of us to go and join community discussion groups where you'd find out where are the fisher fishers going. And where are they finding places where they used to be able to go and now they can't because the bathymetry or the depth of the ocean is now shallower. And we've, had, we've heard stories of at least one of those, which is quite exciting for a project focused on that exact thing for the future. So that was the plan, but obviously we were not going to be traveling very much this summer. So Kirsty and everyone in the project has managed to have, have managed to arrange the... Um, the Greenland Geological Survey essentially to, to do a lot of the work and work with those communities on our behalf in some way. So it's bringing in that, that geological survey and the indigenous communities. And we've always, you know, rather sadly been remote and, you know, communicating with them regularly, but yeah, it has worked out really nicely. And it's going to, I'm looking forward to, you know, the rest of the project post, post COVID. Yeah. It's, it, I think there's so many scientists at Lamont right now who, who, who miss, well, who have had to put their field expeditions on hold and it it's it's hard it's bittersweet it's it's sad so we'll we're, we all want to get back out in the field as soon as we can so i can see that that questions are coming in and, and but i'd also but i'd like to just maybe kind of wrap up this part of our panel by asking each of you it you know it, is there something that you'd like to leave the audience with your thought about what you do or why you do it or or what you think people should be thinking about or worrying about? Should I start with you, Jim? Yeah, it's a, that's a hard question. Nothing uh, immediately pops, comes into mind. I think um, it's the societal questions that are the impetus, but the focus at least for me is on the science. And I think that's the way to go. Try to understand the problem and I see there's a question that asks what our, uh, uh, our greatest challenges are there. So maybe we'll get to that. And try to understand the problem. And everyone here is doing that in a different way. And as you said, all the observations are needed to make sense. This is a highly complex problem. Just the climate itself is complex. How it interacts with the ocean and the solid earth adds extra layers of complexity. So focusing on the science, but being driven by the societal uh, questions uh, and societal issues um, is the way that I like to think how I do my work. Thank you. Jörg, would you have any takeaways you'd like to leave our audience with? The one really motivating aspect of this new era of earth science that we are in is that we are all scientists and we do um, some rather extreme basic science experiments at some point. But what seems really new in the climate field in general is that, and really exciting, is that we, we um, in a way are driven, um, but it's also really just an exciting journey to see how the basic science connects so seamlessly to, to societal science and to societal impact and how it's get, becoming very clear that it's mandatory to have projects like Christy is leading where we have really bring together the scientists and the and this um the communities that are impacted by it 
directly and how this is not a one-way stream but it's really kind of a um, a win-win situation if you get this together. So I'm looking very much forward to that. And then in general, the take-home messages, I think, for um, our viewers and our friends here joining us, um, be believe in science. Um, we are, we are um, really, we are on a track to decipher one of some of the really, really big problems that we will need and join us for the young ones. Join us, um, look into earth science. It's a really fascinating field. It will be, or there is already, and will be accelerating. So to be well, probably one of the m most important things that we can have to do as, as all um, human society together. Especially as our planet is changing so fast right now. Kirsty, would you like to leave us with some more inspiring words? <laughs> <laughs> Get all fired up again. Um, I think I think my takeaway is that this this is an important question, and I think I think there's a everybody understands that it is important on a on a personal level. Um, it's really important to me to emphasise that it's measurable. You know, I've been involved in these observation campaigns and. Some of the measurements that we are able to make now are mind blowing. You know, it's really amazing the precision um, that we can record this system in. So uh, I think we should be encouraged by that. And yes. with those measurements that it's a it's a planable, uh, like we, we can plan, we can prepare for these changes because the cleverness that allowed us to make those measurements is the same cleverness that we can apply in this place that we live to make my house safer. <laughs> well said. Um, and, and Johnny, how about you? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, I can't really top all these great sentiments about the science. I, I agree really, it's, it's something we, we, we do have the skills and the, and the expertise and the instrumentation and the, the know-how to do something about and, you know, like Jörg said, we, you know, join us in a way. I wanted to end on a, I was involved with the careers panel earlier in the week. So I was going to say about, you know, highlight what a rewarding and viable career option geoscience is for, for people interested in science. You know, I started in physics. I think several people have just, you know, get in there and look into geoscience as a possible career because, you know, beyond just all the obviously exciting stuff like field work and, you know, helping out the planet and doing all these wonderful things, which we're trying to inspire you, you with. It's actually a very rewarding day-to-day -day job. You know, if you, you know, if you're going to have to go out and earn a living somehow, this is a seriously good option. So look into that if you're young and at that point about deciding what you want to pursue. Well said. Thank you, Johnny. And, and, and thank you everyone. And Kirsty, you know, and, and Jim, just thinking about the fact that, yeah, I can go down to, the beach on Long Island where I was last weekend and say, the scientists could measure that this was three millimeters higher globally averaged around the world with great accuracy. And that is amazing. It is incredible to think about what we can do. Um, so we do have some questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, I'm going to read them uh, from, from the chat where they're being put and um, and we can see who, how we can do here answering uh, people's questions. So the first one is, could there be a balancing effect between the earth rising and sea level rising? Are isostatic timescales that short to help the New York City rise due to Greenland melting? So um, there are a couple of timescales involved uh, in, in, with the earth. Um, one is a very long time scale. Uh, that gives us post-glacial rebound. So on the time scale of, of thousands or tens of thousands of years, the earth behaves um, like, a, um, like, like a dash pot. And so you push on it and it sort of slowly gives. But on short time scales, the earth behaves almost like a spring. So what gets removed from Greenland this year, this month, this week, is transmitted through the earth almost instantaneously uh, using that sort of spring-like reaction. So with, with respect to New York, I mean, uh, 
New York used to be higher because of the loading of the ice sheets and now it's subsiding, right? So does it add a little bit to the ongoing sea level rise from, from the ice sheets, right? So up till, up till now, up till recently, let's say, the, the dominant impact of sea level in New York was the long-term post-glacial rebound signal. We, we happen to be, so in, in uh, Northern Canada, 20,000 years ago, there were three kilometers of ice that melted very rapidly and the earth is very slowly coming back to its original shape. That's causing the land to rise in, uh, in Canada, but we're kind of outside that and we're actually falling to kind of uh, uh, conserve mass, so to speak. Um, and up until now, that, that's been the dominant effect in New York sea level rise, but that is the, the land sinking into the ocean, but that's changing right now. And now with Greenland melting more rapidly, ice, uh, Antarctica coming on, it's going to be that the ocean itself is, is beginning to rise very rapidly. So I think the next question might, might go to, to Johnny or, or Kirsty, and that is, what are your readings predicting that the ice will look like in a few years? Are, are there places that, that your instruments are going that are changing dramatically? Like the Thwaites Glacier? Yeah, the Thwaites is a really good example. And that's, that was, it's, a, it's an example of why, we, why it's so fascinating studying ice sheets, because these things are the size of continents, or the size of France, the size of Texas, and the whole thing's the size of a continent, but it's changing on a human time scale. So since we've been spinning satellites around the Earth, looking at Thwaites, it, the surface has gone by, down by 200 meters, 600 feet, which, you know, across an area, you know, tens of miles wide, that's been going on, you know, over the, 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 the career, like the length of individual people's careers which is, you know, astonishingly fast, an astonishingly huge amount of change over such a short time. So if the question was about the immediate future, that over the over a short time scale, that's going to continue. And the edge of the ice sheet is moving inwards and it's thinning. And those two things happen together. Now then the big challenge is, uh, will that accelerate because of those things I was talking about before, like the, the, the ground going in as you go towards the South Pole. And predictions are that that, you know, all predictions are essentially that it will accelerate. And then the question is just how fast will that happen? And, and, and Kirsty, I seem to recall the, the, in, in the research group at Lamont, even just photographs of the surface of the Thwaites Glacier have shown it, like Landsat photographs have shown it speeding up in real time, like over the last few decades. Is that true? Yes, well, when Johnny was talking about the, the satellite record in that area, I I guess I've been flying over that for the last 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see in satellite imagery, you can see changes that happen at the edges. Um, you know, the floating tongue in front of Thwaites broke off and got bashed away in the last uh, in the last decade or so. So you can really see things that you can, that anybody can follow because these photos are online and, and pretty browsable. So we, we hear about it when an ice shelf calves or when you see things happening at the edges and, and anybody can kind of check that out or watch a crack propagate across an ice shelf. And, and it kind of gives us all the ability to make a prediction and be like, oh, it's headed that way and see it happen over the course of, of just a few weeks sometimes. That's but it, it, it's amazing. And then I think it's really important to remember the other point that Johnny made that that's the bit that's that's easy to see in, in a satellite photo, but what we've been measuring for is that surface elevation. So that's almost invisible from um, just looking at the edges of the map, but it's where a huge amount of ice is, is going. Mm -hmm. um, big changes that you can see when we make the, the, the measurements of the height of the ice sheet. So here, here's another question for everyone. Uh, Richard Blaustein asks, in the paleo time frame, if you could list one or two great paleo open questions about the cryosphere that would illuminate, uh, that 
whose illumination would most help with understanding our current situation? What would those open questions be? Yeah, maybe I can start this. Um, sure. So as you as you oh, as you said, Mo, before um, we know in the paleo record that from the paleo record that sea level can go up meters in centuries during natural forcings. And I think one of the big, big, big questions is how, how did that actually happen? Where did the ice come from? Um, and how, what can we learn from this natural lesson um, about what is happening in the moment? Um, and the second part of the other statement I want to make is that it's kind of, if I want to reduce all my research about ice changing over since the last ice age or through the last ice age over the last 20,000 years, then certainly one of the major lessons is as soon as the CO2 really changes, as soon as the CO2 goes up, ice follows almost like a slave. And um, given that what we are doing in a moment in terms of CO2 rise and emissions into the atmosphere, we just have to be aware that we will we will tip the system and it's really so mandatory that so important that people who are really looking deeply into processes like Johnny um, will teach us down the road exactly how does this happen? How does this, what does this mean? Where is the tappy, tipping point and what happens if we are really pushing the system over? Because we will, and we kind of know that if you put a, um, one and two together from the paleo record. Anybody else? Yeah, and I can give a couple of specifics. So the, there's times in the past where the CO2 and the, t and the temperature has have been higher than today. And quite simply, some, you know, people are asking, okay, we know that, what were the ice sheets doing? And this is Jörg's research, really. And the, the one where... I'm, right. <laughs> yeah, West Antarctica is the one. So West Antarctica is a part of Antarctica, which is seen as quite vulnerable because it's below the, the bottom of it's below the sea level it displaces the ocean like it's the ocean laps up against it and so the you know really as simple as this it's just did that collapse and disappear during that time when it was warmer than it is today because if it did of course then you might worry about the future where it's going to be warmer and actually and Jörg's done the same thing in Greenland so Jörg's actually done this amazing thing and actually drilled through and found some evidence that it was gone in the past West Antarctica they haven't done that yet they haven't managed to work out how to do that it's still the what's the word, the, 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 um, the holy grail of, of that research is like what happened in West Antarctica in the last interglacial it's called. And um, people have tried to come up with more and more imaginative ways of trying to work it out, even looking at the DNA of different species on opposite sides of the, of the ice sheet to try and work out whether they were connected at some point. Mm -hmm. all, all sorts of wacky ideas trying to work out that answer. And, you know, there are still, you know, people are still working on that. So that's one of the um, the specific question. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next question now. And um, what are the great challenges facing the scientists who are doing this work at this time? And I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Is it logistical? Is it funding? Is it so keeping, being optimistic, keeping your psychological balance? What is it? All of the above. <laughs> I mean, COVID is certainly one of the biggest impacts that the science that, I mean, many of us go to the field and we have field-based programs and that's basically kind of um, frozen by COVID in the moment. So that, that is a huge challenge. Having said that, it's kind of probably on a time scale that we can still deal with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I must say that for me personally, it's kind of, this strange mix of excitement as a scientist to find new tools and see new things and kind of get completely new information. In a way, you're always bringer of bad news if you have that. It's just never kind of working with ice. It seems like there's never really good news in the system in the moment. It just it's, it just gets more. So there is a psychological um, problem and of course the entire um, as we all know the funding situation is always the instability of the funding is always a, a permanent challenge for all of us of course but I mean, they, did uh, get, they did get a second grace expedition up there pretty quick which yeah. is that was a good that was a funding success yeah, story, yeah. Right? and we got funding to drill through Greenland for the first time since the 90s so there's I mean there's a lot of things that we have to also list on the positive side here um, anybody else 
I, I'd like to take a slightly different um, uh, perspective than Christy did on the accuracy that we have. I am bowled over by the accuracy that we have. So I don't disagree with you there. But um, in order to get accurate measurements of sea level change, we often have to combine lots of data, uh, sometimes over decades, to predict, say, what's going to happen just, say, next year, or even um, over the whole globe. And with the climate changing ever more quickly, it's a great challenge to try to get uh, more and more rapid estimates of what the sea level is doing. And so even though, yeah, we have great accuracy, uh, I, want, I want more, I want better accuracy. I've got to jump in with that then, since we were both speaking at the same time to begin with. And I, what you said is exactly in line with what I wanted to say was the greatest challenge, because um, my, my thought was that it's, it's about bridging these scales. That is what's so difficult to accomplish that uh, you talked about being able to map the gravity field of the earth every month. And uh, how long did it take to do that the first time? <laughs> um, so these last few decades where we know that really rapid changes have been happening are also the, the first time we've had this kind of high resolution of, of data coming in and being able to measure things in this way. And, and we really need to understand how the planet responded to these sorts of circumstances before. We need the paleo work that Jörg is fighting for one data point <laughs> or, or one coastline and finding ways to, to look at the processes that we can understand in high resolution and finding ways to, to get better resolution on that and bridging that understanding with these sparse data points that we have that go way back into the past. It's, it's the thing that I find really inspiring and exciting, but boy, it's difficult. Thank you, Kirsty. You know what, I would, I would just like to wrap up by answering a question that, that came in in the Q&A box from Deb Ratt. And um, I don't know if it's he or she, but she says, people say that climate change is cyclical, that this reduction of the ice sheets has happened in the past and is going to happen again. Apparently, this is a very natural cycle, although it gets repeated over a long time span. Is this true? And I'll say, absolutely, this is true. This is, we study Earth's history. We know that the ice ages are cyclical. We know that the ice sheets grow and the ice sheets uh, shrink back. The ice sheets have, have grown all the way down to Kansas in the past. They've gotten so vast and sea level has dropped 130 meters. So what is happening now is much faster than the natural glacial cycles. The natural glacial cycles should be making the world colder right now. And, uh, and we are warming the world by putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which are natural gases, but we're putting them in at a rate that is about 10 times faster than volcanoes, faster than geologic processes can take them out. And, but, but the thing I like to leave, idea I like to leave people with, it doesn't even matter if humans are the people causing climate change right now. The fact is, is that the earth is warming and there's like half a billion people that are living near the shorelines in our modern civilization. So we have to figure this problem out whether we caused it or not, even though we did cause it. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is tricky. So we have to take everything we know about climate and how climate changes naturally and, and, and take all that information and figure out how to solve this problem. And, and it looks like the easiest way is to really rapidly try to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere because we can't move our planet further from the sun which would be another solution. <laughs> so I'll just leave it with that. I, I hope that this panel inspires people to go out and do more research on their own if they have questions um, and, and think about Earth's climate cycles and, and what we're doing and, and the impacts of sea level rise, what a world would look like if sea level was two, six feet higher than today, for instance. Um, and I'll just wrap up by thanking everybody on the panel. Thank you. You're Johnny, Kirsty, Jim. Um, thank you for all that you do and all your work. And thank you for everybody that's been listening and tuning in all week. I hope to all our different, um, all our different panels and, and, and lectures and discussions. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.